Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I um, have a couple of interesting topics to talk about today and the first one is drug advertising in medical journals. So the drug companies use a lot of methods to market their products as you know. If you watch television you see it in full bloom every night, commercials on TV. But one of them is advertising in medical journals and this creates a whole host of problems, one of which is that the companies that are providing financial support in the form of advertising are um, in these medical journals are the developers and marketers of the drugs that are covered in articles in those same medical journals. Well, I found an article published over 10 years ago that discussed both the problems and the conflicts associated with this arrangement and also offered an interesting alternative that I think that we should start bringing a lot of pressure to see instituted. So first, to outline the scope of the problem, the author state, and remember this article is older, in 2003, the drug companies spent $448 million on advertising in medical journals. I'm sure it's probably a billion by now. Most ads in medical journals are placed by drug and device makers. Additional sources of revenue for these journals is inserts advertising specific drugs. The journals have profiles on all of the, um, or the drug companies, I should say, have profiles on the prescribing habits of doctors. And so inserts go into very specific uh, doctors' journals that cater to their prescribing habits and then the other thing that is a big revenue source is reprinting articles that are favorable to a drug so if you are Pfizer or Merck or one of the drug companies and an article that shows how wonderful your drug is is in the Journal of the American Medical Association you order reprints of that article give it to your drug reps and they go out and call on doctors and show that as a marketing piece and it's a smart strategy. I'm not saying it's a bad strategy for the drug companies. It's just not a very good strategy in terms of what ends up happening as a result of it. So, and, and this brings in millions and millions of dollars a year. Now, analysis shows that the more um, advertising drug companies do, uh, the more prescribed, more of their drugs that are prescribed, um, which explains why the drug companies advertise. But here's a question, and the, art, the authors of this article that I found, they, they asked this, why do journals accept ads from drug companies and they don't take them from other companies that sell other types of products that might be of interest to affluent doctors like cars and vacations? Well, the authors of the article looked up advertising policies of the various journals. I won't read them off to you here, but they found a lot of variation. Um, a couple of them didn't have any advertising policies. Some of them had advertising policies that said we only accept ads from drug and device makers. And then uh, one, PLOS, um, doesn't take any advertising at all. Well, four of the five North American journals accepted only ads for products related to medical practice, and then some of them said we could take consumer products as long as it's not financial services, so it's sort of all over the lot. The authors investigated the use of the issue of expensive advertising in medical journals. In other words, is the cost of doing it so high that only drug companies could afford it or could other consumer goods manufacturers place ads? Interestingly enough, medical journal ads were found to be considerably less expensive than those placed in consumer ads. For example, while the circulation of Vogue at the time was four times higher than the Journal of the American Medical Association, advertising rates for Vogue were seven times higher than JAMA. Sometimes journals even advertised that their rates were so low as compared to other places that drug companies could place ads. Um, the authors note that since journals accept only ads from drug and device makers, they've become dependent upon these corporations, and this creates an incentive not to upset them. And they cited some situations in which uh, the drug companies have made it very clear that they would punish medical journals if they publish something they don't like. So, for example, in 1992, a study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine criticized the accuracy of drug ads placed in journals. As a result, seven large drug companies withdrew their advertising, which, and you have to keep in mind, this is $1992, cost $1.5 million in revenue. Well, you have to imagine that other journals noticed this. Uh, they weren't anxious to upset their advertising base, and the authors were able to find examples and situations where advertising departments and journals have essentially uh, vetoed um, or had contributed to editorial uh, decisions being made. Now, here's the solution. 
The authors state that for many years, the independence of medical journals has been compromised by exclusively relying on drug companies for advertising. This can stop, and one of the ways that it can stop is that doctors are ripe targets for other types of goods and services to be advertised. Think about things like financial services, cars, cruises, clothing, luxury goods, travel, other consumer products, anything that you would sell to an affluent audience. They quote an article that stated, quote, journals would have a larger pool of companies to which they could sell advertising space, and they would reduce the conflict of interest that arises from the practice of only accepting healthcare advertisements. This suggests that healthcare companies are not the first place medical journals should look for advertising. Rather, they are the last place medical journals should look. How about that for a solution? The authors conclude of the, the article I've been referencing that objectivity is compromised by advertising and other financial arrangements with drug companies and quote, medical journals should not accept advertisements from pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, or other industries relevant to medicine. I think that is a fabulous idea. Um, and then the, drug, the journals could say whatever they wanted. There would be no reason to do some of the misbehavior that we see going on all the time, which is you know, even subjecting editorial content to peer review by the same people who cleared uh, or authors of articles that um, the editorial is about. I mean, it just makes you insane. But you could get rid of all of that if the advertising money and support money came from someplace else. How we address the reprint issue, I'm not sure, but uh, at least the, the full page ads would be for cars instead of drugs. All right, next topic. More and more studies are showing that there are links between diet and ALS, the neurological disorder that renders people completely disabled within a short period of time and usually death within a short period of time. For example, according to research that was presented at the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting this year, 2017, eating fish and seafood with higher mercury levels can increase the risk of ALS. The researchers note that previous studies have linked mercury exposure to ALS, and for Americans, the primary form of exposure is uh, eating seafood, contaminating with, with uh, mercury. Uh, the study included 518 people, 294 who had ALS, 224 who did not have the disease. Researchers evaluated the participants' seafood consuming habits, and they also measured mercury levels by uh, doing toenail analysis in both groups. Well, for participants who regularly ate seafood, those in the top 25% had twice the risk of ALS as those who consumed significantly less. Subjects with higher mercury levels based on the analysis of toenail samples also had twice the risk. Now the researchers were quick to say that this does not negate the health benefits of eating fish, but rather that consumers should be really careful to choose seafood that is lower in mercury. And they went on to say that swordfish and shark are high mercury foods and salmon and sardines are considered low mercury fish. Well, the problem with this type of strategy, choosing one fish instead of another for reducing mercury consumption is that much if not most of the time the fish people are purchasing in stores or eating in restaurants is mislabeled or is an entirely different species of fish than what people think they are buying. According to Larry Olmsted, author of Real Food, Fake Food, fish is the most common fake food purchased in the United States. He reports the results of a study showing that in New York City, 58% of retail stores, 39% of restaurants, and 100% of sushi restaurants served a species of fish that was different than the species of fish that was listed on the menu or shown on the label of the package. Olmsted says that in some situations when cases like this have been investigated, the substitutions were just plain gross. He cited one where they didn't know what it was. It was an unknown species that nobody had ever heard of before or seen before. That's kind of frightening when you think about it. And others, the substitutions had the potential to cause acute illness. For example, 94% of the time, white tuna in restaurants is actually a fish called escalar, which can cause GI distress and diarrhea. Escalar is never listed on the menu, but it is one of the most commonly served fish in the United States. But even more important, tilefish, known for its very high mercury concentration, is served or sold in place of halibut, red grouper, and many other popular fish dishes. In other words, there are two problems. People are not usually eating the fish that they think they purchased, and in some cases they are eating foods that are actually higher in mercury while they are trying to make a choice that is lower in mercury because they understand the problems associated with mercury intake. 
Now, the FDA advises pregnant women and children to limit consumption of high mercury fish, and I think you could make a reasonable argument that you might want to avoid eating foods that carry a warning label. I mean, think about this for a minute. But the real issue is that it may not be possible to eat seafood in the United States and entirely avoid high mercury products. Fish is perceived by so many people to be a health-promoting addition to the diet, and in fact, uh, almost you have to have it, when in fact it's not any better and might actually be worse than steak or chicken. I've said for years that it really might be better to leave fish in the water. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next Thursday with more news.